How many here are afraid of failure and because you're afraid of failure, you don't take action on your goals and your dreams. You don't act. Most of the room would raise their hand. Yeah. Like 75, 80% would yeah. raise, like everyone's raised their hand. Yeah. Then I say, how many of you are afraid of success and because of this fear of success, you don't take action on writing your book or launching your podcast or asking the girl out or whatever it is you want to do. You don't take action to accomplish it because you're afraid of what the success will do. And almost just as many people would raise their hand. Mm. And I was always like, what? Wow. You all want success, but if you're afraid of it, success will not come to you. Yeah. Despierta. Imagina. Expande tu conciencia. Vive a tu máximo potencial. Siente infinitos. Hola amigos de Infinitos, estoy más que emocionada, estoy súper contenta, estoy muy feliz porque el invitado que tengo de hoy es súper, súper mega especial y además muy amoroso. Es Luis House, que está aquí con nosotros, mi novio, pero... Luis House, te sí, amo muchísimo. Te amo muchísimo. It's so weird for me to say, like, Luis House. Yeah, you never say my name. I never say, Luis House, how are you? Never. <laughs> I mean, I do say your name every once in a while, but usually it's I like... See, I don't hear it that often. What do I say usually? Say my love or... I say mi amor. Sexy beast. Or, ah. yeah. <laughs> sexy papa. Yes. Sexy papa. No, I don't say that. <laughs> Pero I'm really, really happy because you're coming out with a new book. Mm -hmm. And of course, I wanted to have you in my show yes. to promote it because mm. I have such a good, good, good audience that they're very, very loyal and they are very excited as mm. well as I am very excited for you. This book is called The Greatness Mindset, Unlock the Power of Your Mind and Live Your Best Life Today. How do you say it in Spanish? Eh, la mentalidad de la grandeza destapa el poder de tu mente y vive tu mejor vida hoy. Boom! Wow! I, like I kind of like it how it sounds in, in Spanish like too. It. Yeah, it sounds very powerful. It's the type of book I want to say that I wish I had read 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when I was reading it, I almost forgot you wrote it. Mm. Well, I mean, I know you wrote it, but you know right, what I mean? Like, right. I was like, oh my God, this is so good. Oh my God, I was taking <laughs> notes. Like the people who will read the book, definitely, if you want to launch a business, mm -hmm. if you want to have an amazing relationship, if you want to get rid of trauma, if you want to, like all of these different aspects, you follow the book because you give exercises to people. Yeah. And they definitely are going to be able to do all of those things. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. I Thank want to you. acknowledge you. This is not your first book. This no. is his fourth book, right? Yeah, fourth, third big book. But I've written a couple smaller books, yeah. Yeah. Can you say the names of the other ones? Like the the first one, the first big one was The School of Greatness. And then the second one was The Mask of Masculinity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And you did a book, little one also. But this is the book I wish I would have written before the other two. Why? Why for you? Because this is everything I wish I had known really since I was a teenager about how to manage my emotions and my mind. Mm -hmm. Because I was driven by my emotions to protect myself, to defend myself, to um, get respect, power uh, in my social circles, things like that at school and to feel safe with okay. myself. Mm -hmm. But I was doing a lot of things based on anger, resentment, fear, frustration, or the need to be liked and loved. And so it wasn't that I was bad, but it was just, it wasn't coming from the best place, the most authentic place. And I didn't understand how to navigate emotions. Mm -hmm. As a football player, American football, you know, you're trained to essentially destroy your competition. You know, words like destroy, beat, uh, win at all costs. Don't show people, don't show them emotion. Don't show smash that you're hurt. Them. Yeah, crush them, crush smash them. them. Inflict as much pain as you can upon your opponents. These things are things that you're kind of trained and taught in sp certain sports mm -hmm. in the culture I grew up in. Um, and when you're doing that for, you know, three, four, five, six hours a day, it's hard to go into the other side of your emotions and switch that off and say, okay, I'm going to be loving and kind and compassionate mm. and vulnerable and, you know, express my emotions in a different way. Because when you would show any fear or any sadness or any weakness, 
in sports or in school, typically in your friend group, mm -hmm. you would get picked on, made fun of, bullied, laughed at. And no kid wants to be laughed at by their friends. They don't want to be made fun of. So for me, it was a defense mechanism to fit in and belong to others and be accepted. But when we don't accept ourselves and we don't belong to ourselves, we lose ourselves in the process of chasing certain things or trying certain things. We lose who we are sometimes mm -hmm. to try to fit in with others because we don't fit in with ourselves. And so this, was, this is the book I wish I would have had to read myself to understand, okay, I can, I can heal, I can be safe, I can communicate in different ways, I can find different outlets. Maybe my close guy friends aren't going to support me with my challenges or insecurities or fears because they typically would make fun of me. So maybe I need to go somewhere else to get that support and process emotions. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know how to do that. So it was just, okay, toughen it up, rub the dirt on your, your wounds, mm -hmm. and go out and play harder the next time. Mm -hmm. And don't show any emotion. Um, and I think that works in certain, getting certain results in some areas of life, but it doesn't give you all the, the fulfillment, peace, and significance in other areas. So I needed to learn how to do both. So the question is, how do you do that? Because a lot of the things of, especially in the world that we live, if you want to succeed, let's say, a lot of people go in to say, okay, well, there's this restaurant. I want to compete with that restaurant. Yeah. I want to beat that restaurant. I want to have the best one. I have this taco stand. I want to <laughs> compete with the other taco. You know what I'm saying? So how do, yeah. you, how do you shift? Well, I think two things. One, if you can, collaboration is always better than competition. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a sports game, you know, you're going to try to compete to win. The game is to win. But you can still show up with humanity in the game. You can still be a good sport. Mm -hmm. You can still show humanity in the game. You don't have to do dirty things. And you can lose with honor and respect and appreciation and saying, well, I gave him my best. The opponent was just better. Okay, this is information. Now I need to go learn how to get better so that I can win the next time. Mm -hmm. But that's a certain setting in a business. It's extremely cutthroat in certain industries. And so I don't think that's a bad thing though because you want to figure out how to serve your customer or the potential customer right. the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And if they found something else they like better, it doesn't mean you're worse. It just means you're not different and unique enough to add the value they want. So if you're at a taco stand, you know, and there's another taco stand that pops up right next to you and you start seeing your customers go over there or whatever, that may feel like a challenge or a, a state of suffering in that time of like, oh, okay, my business, my livelihood is now going to suffer. But that means it's just feedback, it's information. Okay, mm -hmm. there's something they're doing that is different. It doesn't mean it's better, it's different. Okay. And Sally Hogshead, a friend of mine says, different is better than better. So don't always mm -hmm. try to be better and better and better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. Try to be unique and different, the thing that only you can provide and offer in the world in whatever business or relationship you're, you're in show up fitting in with yourself fully, being different, not trying to be better. Mm -hmm. So I think it's using your uniqueness to be different and also finding ways to collaborate as opposed to compete. But that's not the mindset that I grew up in and most you know, young men grow up mm -hmm. in where it's more about win at all costs, accumulate as much success, yeah. get the respect and power you want and deserve. And, uh, but that can feel very lonely. You know, when you're the only winner and everyone else is a loser, it's hard to build friendships and relationships. You know, you feel like there's never enough. You don't have enough. You feel like you're always trying to chase more or comparing yourself to someone who has more than you. Mm -hmm. And that is a suffering game. And so it's, it's learning how to play the game within your emotions differently than trying to win at everything. What would you say is, you say it in the book, but I want to hear from you. What would you say is the difference between success and the greatness mindset? Success is really playing a selfish game where it's more about my goals, my success, my accomplishments. Kind of like what you were saying before. Mm -hmm. It's about, it's not bad or wrong, it's just success is about me. Mm -hmm. It's about what I want. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but success does not mean significance and does not mean peace and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. You might accomplish a lot, and there's people listening or watching who probably has a friend who's been very successful but still unhappy inside. Yes. Why is people. that? Or why is their relationship not working? Or why do they make a lot of money but then they, they blow it all and they spend it and they go bankrupt quickly? Mm -hmm. 
Why do they feel like they're in breakdown? Why are they unhealthy physically? You know, maybe they have success in certain areas, but they're still not fulfilled. And if they really, if you really ask them, how happy are you? How peaceful are you? How much harmony do you have inside of your emotions? Most of the time, it's not at the top of the scale. It's usually in the middle or, or lower. And people are chasing for more and more success to fulfill a, a hole that is un, you're mm -hmm. unable to fill with mm -hmm. success alone. You need to first feel whole mm -hmm. or feel like you're on a healing journey by owning the past, accepting your past, and where you're at currently. It doesn't mean you have to like the past. It doesn't mean what happened in the past was fun or good. It could have been really challenging. But being in full ownership of what happened and responsible for your, your feelings about the past. And when you're in that state, then you're saying, okay, I accept who I am. I'm enough with where I am currently. But I want to strive for more. Cool. But when we strive for more because we don't feel enough or we feel less than, mm -hmm. I don't care how much you accomplish, you're, it's not going to make you feel enough. So we must learn how to feel through acceptance, ownership of the past, and healing the past. Mm -hmm. So then when we create, we're creating from a different energy. Not from an energy of lack or right. less than or not enough. But an energy of, okay, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm still accepting where I'm at. Now, what do I need to learn, overcome, create, grow, deliver into the world in order to attract what I want more? But it's not from a, a, an empty place. It's from a, a healing and whole place of acceptance. Mm -hmm. So success is selfish. Success is about me. The greatness mindset is about we. And it's about creating what you want from a place of service, from adding value to your friends, your family, and to yourself emotionally, not just physically, monetarily, accomplishment-wise, but also emotionally and spiritually. And when we step more into the greatness mindset, you will accomplish all of the success you want for you, but you'll also be helping others and empowering them in their life as well. And that's about yeah. greatness over success. I want to say that I see you doing that mm -hmm. every day, and I want to acknowledge you for that because I know you you show up this way in the world it's not only that you wrote the book and then that's it and it's information no you live that information mm -hmm. i see you creating that with our relationship every day mm -hmm. with your collabor collaborators with all the people that your team you know with every place every restaurant we go to you're so kind to everyone and i don't <clears throat> it's interesting because i don't in our conversations, I don't hear you struggling as much into the, I want more, I want more, I want more. Mm -hmm. It's more like, how can I expand and create a win-win situation with other people? Yeah, a lot of times I, I don't know, with, with us, I'm like, I want less stuff in our home. I want less, I, want, <laughs> I don't want to accumulate more. I actually yeah. like, I want intentional and less, yeah. less clutter more space well, we don't have a lot of we don't have clutter i'm know? just saying but i'm not saying like i want to buy this and this and this oh yeah you know it's so. more of like i want to have an environment and a space so that we can create abundance in our life yeah. but abundance doesn't necessarily mean physical things or no. monetary things no. but when we create more abundance for ourselves space for ourselves and abundance for others then just opportunities will come and we can either take them or not but mm -hmm. Again, making sure everyone else wins around you in the best way possible. I think that's more of the greatness mindset mm -hmm. than the success ideal is I want to succeed for me. I want to accomplish for me. I want to win for me so I can look good, so I can feel enough. Yeah. But if you don't feel enough and you succeed, it's not going to make you feel enough. There's a lot of unhappy millionaires and billionaires in the world a lot. who still don't feel enough. Mm -hmm. So when will it be? Is it a billion dollars, five billion, 20 billion, all the money in the world? That still won't feel enough if you don't feel you are enough in this moment. So what was it for you? What was that inflection point that made you go from, I'm the athlete, I'm, I'm, I'm the win, win, win for yeah. me, for me, for me, to now it's about everyone else also. It's been a 10 year journey, right. as you know, yes. and it's, it's an ongoing evolution of growth and healing. Okay. But it started 10 years ago when I personally had my own version of success from sports to USA handball team to 
you know, making millions of dollars in my business to building a small audience at that time and thinking, okay, I've got some success, some results, but I didn't feel successful. I didn't feel fulfilled. I felt actually really overwhelmed, anxious, stressed. I felt unsure of myself, insecure, and unable to navigate the emotional challenges properly. Mm -hmm. I could react really well and get angry and defend myself and just push through things and work harder, but that didn't help me feel peaceful. And so it was a number of breakdowns in multiple different relationships from a business partnership to an intimate relationship I was in to friendships where it was just like everything was breaking down okay. in my life. And I was, I was getting frustrated at everyone else around me, but I was the common denominator. I was mm -hmm. the one who was in these relationships. So I had to look at myself when it was all of these relationships were struggling in some way that I was in, in responsibility. And that's when I started really opening up my heart and breaking down my ego in different ways. Okay. The fact of allowing myself to receive honest feedback about how I was showing up. Why is it so hard for people to receive feedback, you think? Because no one wants to be wrong. No one wants to look bad. <laughs> okay. No one wants to think they have something broken within them or that they need to change or evolve. And quite honestly, no one needs to. It's not about needing to change or evolve. It's about what are you doing that is useful and effective to having the most abundance internally and the abundance externally or having the ability to do what you want mm -hmm. while feeling peaceful in the process. So again, this is not about like, you don't have to change who you are right now, right? in my mind. But if you're not feeling the way you wanna feel and you're not creating the results you wanna create, then you're responsible. And so you just have to ask yourself, is how I'm showing up useful and helpful for me to getting the results I want? Mm -hmm. If it's not, then feedback is extremely helpful. Yeah. Getting feedback from the right people and different sources of saying, how are you showing up? Uh, and making sure it's the right type of feedback. And I, and I think that's, for me, it was doing workshops, it was doing therapy, it was doing different healing modalities that allowed me to receive honest feedback from a number of different credible individuals who could give me insights, who could show me a reflection of myself that maybe I needed to take a look at where then I could go look in the mirror and say, who are you? And look at myself mm. and say, who am I really? What were they saying then? Because I didn't know you then. Yeah. So for me, it's interesting to see, you know, to well, I hear. Love this, I love this analogy. You know it. Um, we've heard this many times because we listen to a lot of Wayne Dyer. But yeah. he has an analogy where he has an orange. And when he squeezes an orange, he says what's inside of, uh, of the orange is orange juice. Because mm -hmm. that's what's inside of the yeah. orange. When you squeeze it, you apply pressure to the orange. Orange juice comes out because that's what's inside. When you squeeze a human and you apply pressure, you apply stress, you apply something from your job or from your mm -hmm. marriage or your business, there's pressure. What comes out of the human is what's inside of the human. So if it's bitterness, angry, resentment, uh, resentment. frustration, you know, protectiveness, whatever, you're guarded, all these different things, mm -hmm. that's what's going to come out. Mm -hmm. Now, I had love and passion and excitement and wisdom inside of me, creativity inside of me, but I also had anger, resentment you know, the feelings of depression when I'd get overwhelmed, I would get in kind of these depressed, closed off states. So I had both of that inside of me. Mm -hmm. But when you poked my wound and you hit the trigger and the button went bing, then like <laughs> that's when the, the nasty stuff would come out. Okay. When you poked and hit the other good sides of me, love and excitement and creativity would come well, out. But that's easier, right? Easier. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn to not resist what was inside of me but actually face it and say, but I didn't want to think that was inside of me. No one wants to say I have anger and resentment and bitterment and I don't forgive no. inside of me. We just say, this person hurt me, this person screwed me over, this person's trying to attack me. It's all their fault. Mm -hmm. Screw yeah. them. Yeah, It's easier to point the finger. It's very easy. You know, my family say people point the finger, but then these three other fingers yeah. are pointing at, me, exactly. at you. So yeah. what are you doing in that part, right? Yeah, so... And my friend, um, I mean, so I had to, I had to get the feedback, okay. which was extremely challenging for me to do because I thought I had all the answers. <laughs> Based on results okay. in my external world, I was creating success. Mm -hmm. I was creating results. 
I was getting things to happen. I was working hard and I would, my dreams would come true. But my, so my external world, people thought I had the answers, but my internal world, I knew that I was struggling and suffering and I was good at masking and hiding it and just mm-hmm. acting like everything was fine. You know, when I was in, in, when I was by myself, I was a mess sometimes when my wounds would get poked. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had to learn how to, to face all the, the sad, scary, suffering feelings that I had never really faced that I was running from and chasing other things to not feel them. Mm-hmm. But if we run from our past, it's eventually going to catch up to us yeah. if we don't face it. If we don't turn around and have a conversation and address our past, it's going to just keep coming and chasing us. We're, all ch- we're chasing success to get away from it, and it's just right there in our shadow. So I had to learn to turn around and face my shadow, and I had a lot of them, and learn to accept it, not run from it. Learn to mm. appreciate, okay, this happened, it wasn't fun. What's the meaning I want to give this so that I can have more love, joy, peace, and freedom inside of me as opposed to anger, resentment, and hatred? Mm-hmm. You know, so it was facing those things, it was developing tools, it was going to workshops, it was getting coaching, it was all those things to support my growth. I think it's really hard to do it on our own. So for me, I like having coaches, accountability, friends, support, where I put myself through challenges. Mm -hmm. As an athlete, I want to experience something. Um, So just thinking about something doesn't work for me, I want to experience it. Meditation workshops, breathing, ice baths, hot hot saunas, um, things where I can feel and process the pain. So that was, the start of the journey 10 years ago was a number of breakdowns that caused me to just take a look in the mirror and reflect. Mm-hmm. In the book you talk about, you know, it says right here, unlock the power of your mind. And unlocking to me brings me the image of a key. You know, there are certain aspects in the book that you talk about, these different keys, different things mm. that if you unlock them, then you can create greatness yeah. versus just success. You know, you just said it. Talking about your wounds, talking about the I'm not enough, I don't feel enough, so then mm-hmm. I gotta compete. And then shifting to how can I create a win-win for other people. Yes. And how for you do you think people can apply the same tools towards relationships? Well, first I think you have to reflect on the relationship you have with yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And everything for me starts with a healthy identity. So okay. I'm going to give you context first. On page 201, there's a graphic that I think is really helpful. That if you get the book, just go to page 201 right away and you'll see this graphic. And the graphic talks about the difference between a powerless mindset and a greatness mindset. Mm-hmm. So I'll just show it really quick so you can see kind of this graphic. <laughs> yes. So a powerless mindset, so this is for relationships. This is for anything though, if you think about this. So I'm just gonna define the difference between someone who I think is more powerless and their ability to create peace, harmony, and abundance and manifest their dreams faster versus someone who's able to do it quicker while having peace and harmony in their heart. Mm. Uh, a powerless mindset is someone that lacks a meaningful mission. Mm-hmm. So when we are not clear in a relationship why we're entering a relationship or mm-hmm. the mission of that relationship, every relationship has a mission. Right. If we're not clear, then we just don't know what we're doing in the relationship. We're just doing it to have fun, but then what's the actual process? What's the path? What's the, the thing you want to create mm-hmm. in the relationship? Mm-hmm. So lacking a meaningful mission is a dangerous thing. I think that is the enemy of greatness when we are unclear of anything. Again, a relationship, Mm -hmm. a business, a career, life. When we're unclear, it sets us more up for being powerless Mm -hmm. because we're letting other things determine our life as opposed to us designing our life. I I wanna say something before you go to the next one. I love that you're doing this because sometimes we jump into relationships because it feels so it feels good, good. Or there's an right? attraction or there's a whatever, yeah. But if you were to start a business, you wouldn't just jump into a business quickly, right? You would not probably, on the first day with not someone. Not in the first, yeah. exactly, not on the first date. Not on the first day you're meeting your potential business partner. No. You, would, you would have a process of getting to know that mm-hmm. person, of knowing their values and their vision and everything. So yeah. I love what you're talking about because most people don't apply this 
to relationships, but they apply it to businesses. Yeah, we, we want to give our money to a stranger, but we give our heart to strangers mm -hmm. when we get in a relationship yeah. so quickly, you yeah. know, um, which it's harder to uh, navigate the emotions than it is money. Although money can be a very emotional thing, but it's harder to navigate the heart. So lacking a meaningful mission is something that makes you feel more powerless. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're bad or wrong. It just doesn't give you 100% power and authority over what you're doing. Yeah. When you're controlled by fear, you're in a powerless mindset. So we're all going to experience different types of fears. And it's not bad to experience fear or to be like, ah, oh, that thing scares me. But when it controls us, we are powerless to the fear. That's why in the book I give processes on how to identify our fears and overcome them so that we can navigate them easier. I want to talk about it yes. later, yeah. The third thing of a powerless mindset is being crippled by self-doubt. I believe self-doubt is the killer of all dreams. You can have all the talent, all the skills. You can be the most beautiful person. You can have all the money. You can go to all the schooling, get all the degrees. But if you doubt yourself, you're not going to be able to step into your greatness. So you have to learn how to over overcome the self-doubt, which we talk about. The beautiful thing is, if you do believe in yourself and everyone else doubts you, you can overcome the doubters if you mm. learn to believe. So it doesn't matter if the world thinks you are great and says you can do it and they put you in the position to do it. If you don't believe, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how many other people believe. The whole world could be in your favor, but if you're against you, you lose. Yeah. But the whole world could be against you, but if you learn to believe, mm -hmm. you win. And that could also happen in relationships too. 100%. Like there's this amazing woman, you know, or amazing guy, and everyone looks from outside to inside and say, oh, you're wonderful, you're incredible, but for some reason they're, you know, they don't have quote unquote luck in love. Mm -hmm. Well, it's probably because they haven't. I just think self. Yeah. I think self doubt also kills relationships. Mm -hmm. When one person is constantly doubting themselves in the relationships, that's cute for the first few months. That becomes then, something that is you resent in your partner if they're constantly doubting who they are. Um, if they constantly look in the mirror and they say, "Ah, oh, I look bad in this outfit. Yeah. Uh, I look bad here. I look. I don't look good here." And if you're if your man or your, your girl is like telling you, no, you look great. You look awesome. Yeah, you, you look, look amazing. amazing. No, I don't. no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. Ah, I need to change. I need to change. And you're mm -hmm. always doubting you. It's cute in the beginning of a relationship and then until it's not. And then you're like, yeah. what I'm can I do? I'm well, exhausted. You're exhausted. Yeah. Because nothing you say, no matter hugs, kisses, validation, will give someone belief and confidence in themselves. It might help, but they have to learn to accept it and receive it mm -hmm. and believe it. Mm -hmm. And if your partner is constantly doubting themselves and you're always having to drag them up to get to a baseline of like, <sighs> are I'm they okay? okay. <laughs> it's just exhausting. Yeah. It doesn't support the relationship. Mm -hmm. Again, it doesn't mean you're bad and wrong. It's just not useful. Yeah. It's not helpful. It's not abundant. It's not greatness. It's powerless. Mm -hmm. It's holding you back. Mm -hmm. and, and we've all done this in relationships yeah. at different times. Yeah. I don't look good. How does it look on me? Or it's, the it, type of relation. I feel like he's gonna leave me at any moment. Or, or the guy. Exhausting. I feel she's gonna leave me. It's that's draining. That's suffocating. draining. You're suffocating. like, wait, I'm here for you. I'm here. I'm here. Suffocating. And eventually, you end up leaving, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you repeat it again, and, and you get scared someone's mm -hmm. gonna leave you. Um, right. Someone, a powerless mindset, is someone who conceals past pains. Uh, I think in the first like ten minutes of knowing you, I opened up about like my past pains. You did. I don't think I was intending to it just kind of came up in conversation about things of our past and I realized that when we and there's a time and a place for everything I think I just didn't care how you thought about it at that time <laughs> but if you're in a relationship or you're dating someone you're getting to know them you don't have to do this right away make sure you feel like you can trust the person when you reveal these things but when we are unable to share our past pains with someone we really care about it means that has power over us. Mm -hmm. We're afraid that then we're not going to be accepted by someone else mm -hmm. if they know this thing about me. But again, we're trying to run away from a past as opposed to facing it and accepting the past and accepting who we have been, what's mm -hmm. happened to us, what mm -hmm. we've done. So we're afraid to reveal it to someone else that we care about because they may not accept us, we won't belong, we won't fit in, we won't be loved or seen. Yeah. 
And therefore, we don't say these things because we feel like they won't accept us. Yeah. But we don't accept ourselves, and that's why we don't do it. Mm-hmm. But when you're in a state of confidence with who you are, you can say whatever you want and know, okay, if this person doesn't accept me, they're not for me. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to needing to put on a perfect uh, message or, or conversation about stuff from your past. So concealing yeah. past pains make you, makes you powerless in relationships mm-hmm. in life. Defined by opinions of others, again, makes you powerless. So learning not to be so concerned about the judgment of someone else. Now, when it comes to matters of the heart and love, when you care for someone and you want someone to love you, this is very challenging. Because you do care about the opinion of someone else right. that you're in a relationship yeah, with. Yeah, you do. If you didn't care, also that's kind of weird. You do right. care. I care, but I'm not defined by your exactly. opinion. Exactly. And when exactly. you're defined by someone's opinion, they have power over you. Mm-hmm. And that is powerless. So that's the fifth thing. The sixth thing, the final thing, is you drift towards complacency. I don't think any relationship thrives when one person just says i'm not going to work on myself at all i'm just going to sit back and do the same thing (laughs) every day uh you do all the chores you do all the work i'm just going to like do the bare minimum Mm -hmm. show up accept me for being like who i am i don't think that's again a greatness mindset that's a, a powerless mindset we are here as humans to grow i'm not saying you have to go above and beyond and like save the world in your ambitions, but growing as a human internally, Mm -hmm. spiritually, emotionally, mentally, those things will make you more powerful, not powerless. But when you're drifting towards complacently, when you're declining your growth, and you're just like, I'm not gonna try, that's not powerful. So we wanna first be aware of these six things. Again, Mm -hmm. in, in page 201 of the book, I give the graphic to make it easier. Think about these six things and ask yourself, is there any of these that I do in my life currently? Mm -hmm. Do I have a clear mission for my life or my relationship? If not, okay, then I might be struggling a little bit. Am I controlled by fear, crippled by self-doubt, all these different things. So first be aware. Then you gotta make a decision. Do I want to be powerless or be great? Mm -hmm. Okay. I like that question. Do I want to be powerless or be great? Do I wanna be powerless or Mm -hmm. do I wanna be great? If you wanna be powerless, then Based on actions, based on emotions, and the way you think about yourself, if you're doing any of these six things, you are in a powerless state. It doesn't mean you can't still build a thriving business or have a great relationship or be healthy or accomplish goals. I did a lot of these accomplishments from a powerless mindset, Mm. but it left me feeling like I couldn't sleep at night because I was always worried and stressed out. Mm -hmm. It left me feeling very anxious in relationships. I could get in a relationship, but then I was like, abandoning myself and anxious, Mm -hmm. trying to please someone else always because I was defined by the opinions of them. So it didn't mean I couldn't get in a relationship or launch a business, but then I was defined by the opinions which made me give in to what they thought of me. And lose your authentic self. Lose your authentic self, lose Mm -hmm. your identity to try to please others. Mm -hmm. And so again, I was getting results externally but suffering internally because I was in a powerless mindset. So we need to decide okay, do I want to be great? Then I need to let go of these things. I need to transform them. I need to alchemize the thing, these elements into something more powerful and beautiful for myself. Mm -hmm. And so there are six elements of the greatness mindset driven by a meaningful mission. That's the first one. Yeah. When we are clear in one sentence what our mission is for our lives, everything else becomes clearer Mm -hmm. in our lives. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more dangerous than a man without a mission. Because a man without a mission or a human being without a mission is kind of taking the scraps of life. is wandering around in circles. Wandering. Doesn't know where they're going to go. And people are going to pull at them in different directions. Come try this thing. Come try this thing. Try this alcohol. Try this drug. Try this sex thing. Try this. It's just going to be pulled anywhere they can fit in and belong and Mm -hmm. feel a sense of meaning or purpose. Mm -hmm. And so we must design our mission based on what we want to create for ourselves. What happens, though, when... I was lucky that I knew my mission, that Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to be an actor, that I knew since I was 11 years old. I really was very clear. It kind of started like around 10, maybe even 9, but it was very clear, like I knew. Did you know you wanted to do this? No. It's different seasons. Right. And I, and I, you know, a mission can be three months, three years, 10 years. It doesn't have to be like, I'm going to be an actor for the rest of my life. And then that's it, right? Right. 
And I talk about in the book how to discover your mission for this mm -hmm. season of life. That is so important. There's three elements to discovering what season you're in and figuring out what mission you want to create for yourself. Oh my God, let's talk about yeah. that because there's a lot of people there that yeah. are in a different stage in their lives mm -hmm. and they want to change their business. They want to, exactly. you know, they want to, I was talking to my friend Lucy, who's Omar Chaparro's mm -hmm. wife, and she was like, I did a whole shift in my life, right? And she's in her mid 40s. Mm -hmm. And then there's also younger people that are part of my audience too that are like, I don't know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do in this world with like, you know, uh, technology and AI and everything? What am I going to do in life? So how do you find that mission in the stage that you are in life? So I'm going to tell a story first, and then I'll tell you how to figure this out. <clears throat> um, there's a guy, my first interview I did in the School of Greatness 10 years ago was with Robert Greene. And mm -hmm. Robert Greene was very talented as a writer. He, he knew he wanted to write, but he didn't know what he wanted to write okay. when he got started in his career. And so for something like 10 years, maybe it was 10, 15 years, he first wrote in like a local newspaper and tried working as a writer in a newspaper after college writing. Then he went to a bigger newspaper. He didn't like the small town, he went to a bigger town. Then he didn't like newspapers anymore but he still he knew he, he knew he still liked writing. Okay. Then he was like, okay, well, let me try like this Hollywood thing and be like a, a writer in TV shows and join like the writers' rooms and like write with a group of writers to write like TV. Maybe that's inspiring. He did that for a while and he realized, nah, I don't really like, you know, doing this style of, of format. Or maybe he didn't like working with a group of writers <laughs> or who knows what it was. But yeah. he didn't like it. Then he tried movies. Let me write scripts. I didn't like that. He was he was okay at it, but he didn't love it. Then I think he wrote like a novel or two, but he didn't really love it. And he was like, I've always wanted to create a unique style of book that solves a problem for me and that I think would help a lot of people. So he started pitching this like style of book and none of the publishers wanted it. They were kind of like, nah, that doesn't really fit what we do. So he got turned down a bunch until finally someone gave him a chance and he worked on writing like the thing that he really loved, which was this unique style of book, ended up being the 48 Laws of Power, which is one of the, the I still, I think still one of the top 100 most selling books right now consistently on Amazon of all books. Like every, wow. every day it's like top 100 almost consistently. Right. And for years has been a mega bestseller in the personal development space. But he wrote a book in a different way. It's formatted differently. It's kind of unique. You don't see anything like it. And it's around unique topic. What he did is we was he used his passion, his power to solve a problem. Mm. But it took him a number of years of trying different things around his power, his talent, until he figured out his main thing, which was writing these unique style of books. Which now he's written like seven or eight types of books like this that continue to be bestsellers mm -hmm. and solve a problem for him and his his community. So there's. In finding your meaningful mission, you really got to figure out what your sweet spot is. Okay. And the first part of that is your discovering your passions and just analyzing what are my passions? What are the things that I'm curious about, that I'm interested in? What are the things that light me up when I talk about them? What could I do mm -hmm. all day long? Even if I didn't make money, what would I love to work on? And yours back in the day used to be sports. But sports. then you had the accident. Yes. How did you, for you, because that's such a big shocking thing, right? You knew you wanted to do one thing. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. something happens. And then you, sh you, you must shift. Yeah. I mean, I didn't so, think I had any skills or talents. And so I was like, well, what am I interested in? Mm. At the time, so at that time, I was like, well, I'm really curious. I'm curious about people. Mm. I like learning about people. And I like connecting with people. people. Yeah, I love yeah. like connecting with people. So I was like, I'm curious about people. But I didn't think I could make money being curious about people. But even if, don't worry about money or a career path right now. Just think about what lights me up. Okay. If I could do anything every day um, and I would never get bored of it, mm -hmm. what would excite me? Mm -hmm. If I never made money with it but I would do it for free, yeah. what would excite me? Yeah. And ask yourself those things about yourself around your passions. The second thing is your power. These are the skills and talents that you have. Okay. So Robert Greene, he was really powerful as a writer. Mm. He just didn't know which direction to take his writing. Right. He tried it in a lot of different things and it didn't work. But when you're figuring out your meaningful mission, you might need to spend years trying different things. Okay, I know what I want, my talent, let me go try this 
thing. That didn't work. Let me try this. Um, that didn't work. You know, as an actor, you tried a lot of different things yeah. until you became the queen of rom com in Mexico. <laughs> And you realize, oh, I'm really good at this, right? and I like it. <laughs> then I, I wanna... started writing them. Then you started writing them. Then and you producing started doing them. All these yeah, you exactly. expand on the same. Yeah. So your power is your talents. It's okay. the gifts. It's your uniqueness. It's the things that you bring to the table in life. But I also look at in this part of your sweet spot. I think part of your power is figuring out what also makes you feel powerless. Hmm. The insecurities or fears or things you lack. So for me. I felt powerless standing in front of an audience 15 years ago because public speaking was not something I could do. So mm. it, was a, it was a lack of a talent. Right. So I knew, I started asking myself, what are my talents? And then what are the talents that I lack, that I wish I had, but mm. they make me really afraid? These things are gonna hold me back from my meaningful mission. So I must go on a journey to overcome these things that make me right. feel powerless and then when you overcome those things, it's not a talent, it's like a super talent. Because you've overcome one of your biggest fears, now you have a skill that you thought you would never be able to have. Mm -hmm. It's like unlocks a whole nother thing. So your power, power is your talent, your unique strengths, but also figuring out what makes you feel powerless and going on the journey of overcoming those things. Mm -hmm. The third thing, which I think is the intersection of discovering your meaningful mission, is the problem you wanna solve. Hmm. Our friend Rory Vaden says that we are perfectly positioned to help the person we once were. So if 10 years ago you were struggling to, to, to lose weight and you got really out of shape and almost unhealthy and sick, but then you went on a journey and learned how to do it for yourself and you got super healthy, you're perfectly positioned to help someone else in that position now that you were 10 years ago. Wow. You've got the experience, you've got the wisdom, you've got the hardship, you've got the, wi the lessons, you've got the skill set mm -hmm. to help that. Mm -hmm. So it's figuring out what problem you want to solve for yourself or for others. What's meaningful to you? Robert Greene had this with this like unique style of writing. Right. He's like, I want to solve these problems for me and then share it with others. Mm -hmm. But do it in a unique way that I'm passionate about and talented in with my power. And for you with the School of Greatness. Yeah, I, I never thought that... It, I could, you know, make a full-time living just being curious about people. Mm -hmm. Like that, my passion was like, I'm interested in people. Right. I was, my talent was um, I'm good at getting people to open up when mm -hmm. I talk to them. Yeah. But how is that going to make me money or be a career? I had no clue. But that's why you can't think about the money or the career right away. You got to think about, is this something I would do even if money wouldn't happen? Eventually, you got to figure out how to make a life, uh, make a living doing something. Yeah. Um, if that's what you want to do, but yeah. but I think don't stress about that up front because mm -hmm. if I would have stressed about that, I would have said there's no way that I'd be hosting a show, making money, doing what no, I'm doing. No, can you imagine? Fifteen years ago, when right. I was like on my sister's couch, there's no way that I would have imagined this would be possible mm -hmm. if I was so concerned about how do we make money doing this. Mm -hmm. So that that gets you clear on your meaningful mission. Um, again, That's so good. Going back into the greatness mindset, yeah, overcoming self, like someone who overcomes self doubt and turns fears into confidence, is a part of the greatness mindset. Mm -hmm. Someone who heals past pains, again, I think if we aren't willing to heal, that will always have power over us, and we'll be driven by something that we're afraid of, as opposed to something that we're inspired by. Mm -hmm. Creating a healthy identity. This is something that I think people don't. I think it's talked about, but I don't think people truly understand. How do you create a healthy identity? Well, imagine that, again, everyone watching or listening, think about this for your own life. For many years of my life, if you would have had a, a tape recorder in my mind, okay. hearing my thoughts, mm -hmm. recording it, and then if you would have played it on a loudspeaker, you know that when I go to Mexico with you and there's always someone driving around in a truck with a... And I'm always like, what are they saying? It's like this truck drives around <laughs> yes. nonstop. What are they saying? It, there, it's this basically, it's this pickup truck in my country that yes. goes around town. I mean, there's many of them, but obviously. It's all over Mexico, but it's the it same sounds, recording right? in every single pickup truck. All over Mexico, right? All over Mexico. And they're asking you to donate your fridge, your stove, your microwave any cables, any anything that is so, not working anymore in your house, put it there in that pickup truck because they'll every, take it. This is everywhere in Mexico, everywhere right? Everywhere in Mexico. Every town has this. stuck in it once, once, like, if you hear it once, it'll But I feel like it's all, every hour. It's like every hour <laughs> and they're true. like, they put it on a loudspeaker yeah, and it's on true. some truck and you're like, 
what is going on? Because here? they say, compran colchones. Yes. <laughs> is that the same voice it's everywhere? It's the same voice. It's the same as with the tamales oaxaqueños. Really? It's the same voice, the same recording. And I kind of want to interview whatever that person did that so recording. So wait, the same recording everywhere in Mexico. Everywhere in Mexico, they all have this. Jeez. Okay. It's so funny. It's like the Siri of <laughs> asking for donations. Exactly. It's like the same exactly. voice. Exactly. Yeah. So imagine this then. Everyone should understand this concept. Imagine you record your inner conversation, your inner dialogue, mm -hmm. as, 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 as if it's a, a conversation that you could record. Yeah. And then that is played in the streets of your city, of your voice. Saying all these and things. And everyone knows it's you saying this. Wow. But imagine it's a hundred times louder than that truck driving around, which is already extremely loud. <laughs> imagine it's a hundred times louder yeah. and it's going around the whole city every hour on repeat your entire life. But we do that. You say, of you saying, I'm an idiot. I suck. I'll never mm -hmm. amount to anything. I'm such a loser. What is wrong with me? No man's ever going to love me. No woman's ever going to be with me. I'm never going to amount to anything. <laughs> if yeah, if we, no yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm yes. an idiot. I suck. All this stuff. Imagine it's, that happening. Mm -hmm. They would send you to a mental mental institution, oh, a hospital. Sure. They would send you somewhere. If they heard this, they would be at your doorstep being mm -hmm. like, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are, like, is everything okay with you? But the thing is, us doing that, and imagine us saying those same things to our, our parents, our siblings, our best friends, I wouldn't want to hang out with that person. Imagine That's if I thing. said that to you. No, I'd be Every like, day on repeat. Yeah, you're an idiot. You're up. Constantly. I'd be like, you know what? Move over there. <laughs> I don't so wanna... this this is a but we have it inside this is of a us. this is an unhealthy identity, mm -hmm. and a greatness mindset learns how to create a healthy identity. Yeah. Now again, we say these things based on a belief we have about past memories and experiences. Mm -hmm. Imagine this scenario. Imagine today they they uh, do the Men in Black. You know. Uh, they delete Pen, my memory. And they delete your memory. And you know, boop, you no, I want to remember you. You'll remember me. <laughs> I can't delete that. You know? But they, okay. they delete every negative thought you have about yourself okay. from your past. Every pain, every past like adversity, suffering, any event that ever occurred to you that was painful, it's just boom, gone. And all mm -hmm. you have is just either positive memories or neutral memories. Okay but not stuff that hurts you or wounded you emotionally or psychologically. Okay, zero. So no yeah. one hurt you, no one did anything, no one ever said anything mean to you. Okay. Your parents never like said, oh, you are you don't look pretty in that, you look fat, or whatever it is. You don't remember any of that. Okay. You would have a healthy identity about yourself. Absolutely. You would have an identity that's like, man, I'm in this world, it's so beautiful, I'm yeah. so grateful, yeah. wow, I feel so good. Mm -hmm. It's the past experiences, memories, and moments that we have given so much weight, so much attention, where we say, I'm never gonna amount to anything, I'm stupid, I'm an yeah. idiot, because of getting picked on in school or being picked last or being in the bottom of my class. Those memories, those, those experiences cause me to give myself a negative conversation, right? That I would say on repeat yeah. all the time. You know what's crazy though? That it's proven today that half of what we remember is a lie. Like, think about that. Half of Unless what it's we the good remember, stuff that I did for you. Well, you yes, remember. I remember that very well. <laughs> but think about that. Half of what we remember is a lie. So yeah. even like when we think about all the traumas that we have, all these different things, I'm not saying that the traumas mm -hmm. are not real. Right, right. But we, we, but we, we build them up. We build them we up. We create more meaning. We amplify the exactly. pain. Exactly. We amplify we, the we pain. We amplify the pain as opposed to amplify a meaning that can serve us in a mm -hmm, better way. Mm -hmm. And Man's Search for Meaning is one of my favorite books from Viktor Frankl, which he went through the Holocaust, one of the most horrific things that a human probably had to experience in our lifetime, saw death all around him, saw horrible things happen to him. But he learned to live a beautiful, abundant, wealthy life wow. emotionally because he created new meaning from his past experiences, from his past memories that caused him so much pain and so many people, pain, suffering, death, loss, horrible stuff. But he made a choice. He said, okay, I don't want this to keep me a prisoner today and for the rest of my life. Yeah. Even though I was a prisoner, it doesn't mean I have to stay a prisoner. Yeah. So how can I be grateful now that I am free and make the most of my life as opposed to say, well, this happened to me and I'm gonna always stay in my past. So we must learn to create a healthy, healthy identity. And that's 
you know, creating a new, but it doing it in a way that you can fully believe and own it. So you can't make a false statement about yourself that you don't believe in. Mm, if you, okay. you can't just say a mantra of like, I'm beautiful when you really don't think you're beautiful. Okay. You've got but to there's find, parts of you that you can say, I, yes, you know what, I have beautiful I love this eyes. about me. I love this about me. I have a beautiful heart. I'm right. generous. I'm, I am a I'm kind a, yes. person. I'm, yeah. So it's learning to, to speak into the things that you actually do believe. Mm. So you know this about me. I, you know, I never thought I was smart growing up because, again, in school, I was in the bottom of my class. And I probably should have been held back a couple of grades because I was just a slow learner. But... I got really good at faking it and trying to like just barely getting by. This right? is fascinating for me to hear because I know you're so smart. Yeah, I know. It's but, fascinating. It's like, what? But, but it was a belief based on mm. experiences of getting poor grades constantly, right. feeling insecure when kids would laugh at me when I didn't know answers. So it's just like, okay, I must not be smart because they are. Mm. So again, if I erase that memory, I'd be like, man, I feel pretty good about myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So 10 years ago, I guess as part of me like going through the journey, I had to create a new identity. And I didn't believe that I was smart at the time. So I can't say I'm a super smart guy. I didn't believe it. But I did believe that wisdom was a word that I could step into. Because I actually felt like I was extremely wise in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. I thought I, and because I had experienced so much challenges, I was like, that gives me wisdom. Ah, Those give me lessons yes. that other people don't have. Mm-hmm. So I was able to like, mm, I have some new meaning around this past challenge or pain. I have wisdom now. Mm-hmm. And I could step into that identity of a wise human being. So again, we've got to learn how to create a healthy identity. I talk about the process in the book. And then mm-hmm. taking action with a game plan. There's something that I probably, I wouldn't say hate, but I, I just don't like okay is when I see someone with all the talent oh I know what you're all say. the potential the mm-hmm. the excitement the who's got a clear vision like I want to accomplish this goal but then they don't take action with a game plan they want advice from you they want all that stuff from you they've got the skills they got the talent they got the support but they don't take action with a game plan mm-hmm. There's something that's still holding them back. Yeah. For me, you must be willing to take consistent action with a game plan. All six of those things tie into the greatness mindset. It's this amazing. doesn't mean that you're perfect and everything's going to be, you know, coming to you like nonstop effortlessly. You still got to show up as mm-hmm. a human, but it just means you're not living in a powerless mindset, which is going to make you feel a lot worse about yourself. Yeah. So page two hundred one gives you the whole distinction of where you're at currently. And it's an just an assessment. And the whole book is a different assessment. And it gives you exercises, which I love. There's a portion of the book that you talk a lot about fear. Yes. Because a lot of the things that hold people back is all these different kinds of fears. Yep. I would love to expand on the fears. Um, you know, there's one of them that you talk about, which is the fear of success. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, was the weirdest one. Because I was like, wait, wait a second, how can people really feel fear of being successful? Because all you hear out there is like people want to succeed. So how come the fear of success can be there? And what does it mean? This, yeah, and I mean, how can you overcome when it? I was, when I was playing sports, I, I wanted to be successful. I wanted to win. I wanted to accomplish. Success was the thing I was going after. I was never right. afraid of it. Mm-hmm. And I knew that failure was the path to achieving success. I was never afraid of failure, but I can talk about that too if you want to. Mm -hmm. But success, when I would go around and speak in front of audiences years ago, I would ask people, how many here are afraid of failure and because you're afraid of failure, you don't take action on your goals and your dreams. You don't act because you're afraid of failure. Most of the room would raise their hand. Yeah. Like 75, 80% would raise, like everyone's raised their hand. Yeah. Then I say, how many of you are afraid of success, and because of this fear of success, you don't take action on writing your book or launching your podcast or asking the girl out or whatever it is you want to do. You don't take action to accomplish it because you're afraid of what the success will do. And almost just as many people would raise their hand. Mm. And I was always like, what? Wow. You all want success, but if you're afraid of it, success will not come to you. Yeah. You are resisting it if you're afraid of it. You're saying, 
I want it, but I don't want it. You're saying, come here, but stay away but from stay, me. But stay, but really don't. And yeah. so you will always sabotage yourself if you are afraid of success. And, and I get it. Six, no one teaches us how to be successful. Mm. No one is as graceful as you are and successful at 16. And just, uh, <laughs> You know, starring in movies and gracefully like walking through the world the way that no, you did. No, but this is the thing though. I was successful making movies, but not successful in my heart. Because mm-hmm. I had to do all, that's why I said, but, I wish I had this book 10 years ago. Yeah. Because if I would have followed all the exercises that Lewis writes in the book, I would have probably met you sooner. Mm. <laughs> you know and what those, I mean? Exactly. No, seriously, yeah, because yeah. I would have done a lot of healing. A lot of no one's no one's taught how to manage and navigate success until success happens. Mm. That's when we learn about how we respond to it. And there's an amazing documentary, I don't know if it's it's dubbed in Spanish, but it's an amazing documentary called The Weight of Gold, which is about Olympic medalists, people who win the Olympics or medal in the Olympics and all of a sudden have the spotlight and all this success that's come to them. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a sad documentary because it's about a number of different athletes who win but then overdose on drugs or commit suicide within the next like six mm-hmm. to 12 months because they don't, know how, they don't know how to manage the success. They could go after it, they could train hard, they could strive to accomplish it, but then once all the attention was on them, the responsibility, the weight of success, it was overwhelming. Mm. And so, and also, and it is. I can understand. It that. is. You yeah. get it. And well, here's the thing. Also, like they don't they don't tell you. Oh, when you go and you you become more successful, no one tells you. There are going to be people that want you to fail and and don't want to be successful. There's going to be people closest to you, that may be jealous of you. There's mm-hmm. going to be people like who are friends or family that may try to like pull you back down. Or the responsibility it takes. Or now, or <laughs> now people come out of the woodwork and say. Oh, now that you're successful, can you help me with this thing? Can you give me this money? Mm. And you feel like being pulled from every direction. Yeah. Like your limbs are just being pulled apart. And you're like, ah, I don't know what to do. And you don't want to let people down, but you're disappointing people. And you have to manage the emotional weight of success. Yeah. So some people want the fame. They want the money. They want the accomplishments. They want the followers. But they don't want the criticism, the judgment, mm-hmm. the backstabbing, the backstabbing yeah. that comes with it. Or the responsibility or the, the amount of work. Or the weight and responsibility. Right. And you've got to be willing to understand that when these things come for you, success comes for you, opportunities come for you, then all the other crap is going to come for you too. And if you don't like it, then don't go for it. Or learn how to manage and navigate it. Mm-hmm. So success is a fear that I, I started to learn, understand as I, I got more successful in the business world because it doesn't feel good a lot of times when mm-hmm. these things happen to you. And there's the whole analogy of the crabs in the bucket um, analogy, which is you put a you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket. Okay. You know, a big white bucket, right? And one crab is like, I don't like being down here, the bottom of this bucket. I don't like being down here with the like, I want to go see what's outside of the bucket. I want to, like, I want to go adventure and see, mm. like, what's outside of the bucket and see if there's anything else beyond this place. And if one crab starts to, like, crawl his way up the bucket, the other crabs pull him down. And this is proven. When you see, like, videos of this, you see the crab finally try to get out. He's almost out. Another they crab pull will pull him down. Yeah. This will keep happening until eventually the crabs will break the legs of the crab trying to leave the bucket. <gasps> oh my God. Break it in half so that it cannot leave oh my the God. bottom of the bucket. And sometimes it feels like this when you're going after your own success. It feels like there might be some people trying to shove you over the top yeah, of the bucket yeah, yeah. to get you out there mm-hmm. and keep those people close. But there might be other people trying to break your legs on the way and bring you back down. And so you just got to be mindful of what who you're surrounding yourself with as you're going after your goals and dreams. See what they're saying. Are they jealous? Are they comparing you? Are they saying nasty things? And it might be Mm well-intended, but it may not be supporting you. So that is a fear. And when you learn to navigate and overcome it, that's a horrible, I like, it's a horrible story. Oh my God. But this happens in so many countries. And actually we have a similar story that we tell in Latin America too, that we do that to people and it's like really? why do we do this to people we should the opposite if somebody is succeeding yeah. 
celebrate be, them. Celebrate them because that's a reflection in the world that you can make mm -hmm. it, it can be possible for you too. And it's and yeah. in a different in a different aspect in your life or in a different thing or just celebrate it. Mm -hmm. Whereas is is it possible for you or not? Like we're all human beings, we're in this world, let's just celebrate each other. Celebrate it. It's so important. And no one wants to hang out with someone or help someone in the future if they're trying to pull them down on their way to success. No. Oh my God, no. So if you want to be supported by people in the future yourself, then celebrate them as they're succeeding, even if you're still you know, down at the, the bucket mm -hmm. in the bottom, like push them out Yeah. so they can pull you over yeah. at some point. I was raised so differently than that bucket story because you know my dad and my mom and they were always, and they've always said this, and I don't know what your thoughts are about this, but they, mom and dad say that success really is about service. And that if you own a restaurant and you, instead of competing with the other restaurant and making mm -hmm. your restaurant better because the other restaurant, no. What kind of service are you mm -hmm. giving? Serve and when you will discover you have, yeah. that you give a good service to anyone, it applies to anything. You know, we Don't are, keep coming back. I feel like I'm in service to you in the relationship, mm -hmm. you know, it's like when you do that, things just like flourish even more. Yeah. And you'll keep having those customers coming back. If you feel like you, you provided a good service, they're like, they're happy customers. They keep coming back. Happy that's why I keep coming back. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's it's true. That's one of the, the important things. I want to ask you this because I don't know if, if I've asked you this actually mm -hmm. recently. When you talk about your stories mm -hmm. and the, the stories of your life, yep. you talk about, which is very, very sad, but you talk about the sexual abuse that you experienced. You talk about your dad having an accident. You talk about your own mm -hmm. wrist accident and not being able to um, pursue your career in sports. In those moments, you experience fear. What's on the other side of fear? Well, on the other side of fear is peace. But you must be willing to face the, the pain, the insecurity, the, the sadness, the frustration, the I'm not enoughness to get on the other side, which is peace and I'm enough. Fear is really like if I fail, if I succeed, and if I'm judged by others, then at the root of that is I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. So that's the root of all these fears. I'm not enough. So if I fail, I'm a loser. I'm not enough. If I succeed, but I squash it all, maybe um, maybe people will finally find out that I'm not enough, right? If I succeed, they'll actually see me for who I really am. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going to be able to live up to that. It's too much responsibility. I'm still not enough. And the fear of failure, excuse me, the fear of judgment is... I'm, not, I'm never going to be enough as well. I'm never pretty enough, talented enough. I'm never going to like live up to something. All these fears, the root is I'm not enough. And so when we learn to heal and accept and believe we are enough, on the other side of that is peace, is harmony, mm -hmm. is the ability to express ourselves fully and own who we are. That's on the other side of fear. But it takes... Being aware of it, recognizing it, facing it, owning it, and transforming it. Is there anything you're afraid of today? So let's say that Lewis in 10 years, or even in five, writes another book, and just as you're talking about your past today, and all these, the things that you see clearly about the past and your fears in the past, is there anything you're afraid of the today? Only, the only thing I can think of, really, yeah. is disappointing myself. Okay. Because if I dis because I was thinking like I don't want to disappoint others, but I think I'm there's I can't control how others respond to me. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I never disappoint you. But there might be something I unintentionally do that disappoints you for whatever reason. But it's never going to be my intention to disappoint you or anyone. It's not like I'm trying to disappoint. But I think disappointing myself I'd be really like that's a fear, it's not a fear, it's just something I don't wanna do. Because okay. I feel like I would regret if I let myself down. So it's more the fear of not doing certain things than it is the fear of like doing some, something. It's the fear that like, 
if I don't go after the thing I feel like I'm supposed to do, I'm disappointing myself, I'm letting myself down. Mm-hmm. I'm abandoning myself to what I feel called to do. I just don't want to live with that fear, you know, and I don't feel like I do, but that's not something I want to do in the future. Any other fear, I mean... But at the same time, I feel that fear keeps you in track. Yeah, it keeps you know? me aligned. Keeps you aligned. It keeps me alive. I mean, so, I don't... so they're good fears sometimes, maybe? So like this fear, the fear of disappointing myself. Mm-hmm. Or like, I'm going to tell you one of mine, you know, I'm afraid of disappoint God, mm-hmm. right? I'm not, I, I want to... Yeah. It, so in a way, that little fear, this is a big fear, you know, keeps me in line and it makes me love myself more yeah. because I'm in integrity. Yes. So. I think it's beautiful. Are there any fears like that for you that you say, you know what, this is a healthy fear. Is fear healthy? <laughs> if it serves your mission, yes. Okay. If it holds you back from expressing yourself fully, if it holds your gifts back, your talent, your love back, then that's not healthy. Okay. I don't think that's good. I think it's holding you back. So I don't know if I'd call it a fear. I just call more of it like a, a value or a moral you're trying to live up to. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to cross those things because you would disappoint yourself. So you don't want to cross a boundary and disappoint God. Because I would be disappointed. But, but that's living in your values. values. Yeah, yeah, that's living your values and your morals. For me, the fear is the thing that causes us to doubt ourselves the most in life. Okay. The unhealthy doubts. Um, and I think that's what it's about for me. So it's it's gaining clarity on that. As long as I live in those those guidelines and boundaries, the only other fear I'd have is like just I don't know, like just waiting too long to do something when I like knew okay now's the time to do it. But I'm like afraid of what people think of me. Or I'm afraid mm-hmm. of failure. I'm afraid of the responsibility. I would that would be my fear if I just like knew I'm supposed to do something, but I waited. And I miss my opportunity because mm. of fear. That's what, that's what I'm afraid of. And that drives me to take action consistently. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's really good. That's really good. Mm-hmm. So we moved into our new home. Mm-hmm. So how do we use the greatest mindset mm-hmm. to have a beautiful, abundant, joyful, peaceful life in our home? Well, I think we've already started the process of it because we, yeah. you know, before we moved in for many months, we set our intentions for it. Yes. So we started but, developing a meaningful mission, mm-hmm. shared mission together around what we want to create. Yeah. By moving in into a home together. By and we did our, it consciously. It was just not yeah. like a whatever conversation. It was a conversation. Yeah, well, we had many conversations about yeah. it, but yeah, we did it consciously and we said, okay, let's set our intention for what we want to create. What's the feeling? What's the environment? The experience? Um... What do, what do you want to create for me? What do I want to create for you? So we yeah. had these conversations consciously. I think that's the greatness mindset. Yeah. Again, we, we, we don't conceal past pains. We've been doing that since we've known each other, revealing them. Yeah. So that's the greatness mindset in relationship, moving in together. Um, we're, I think both of us are working on overcoming any insecurities or doubts that might come up in ourselves individually that is the greatness mindset in a relationship as well Mm. like moving into those things we both talk about if we have any fears that might be holding us back and we move through them so that is the greatness mindset it is yeah all of these things so they're part of the book again moving in together was taking Mm -hmm. action with a game plan towards something greater in the future so we're taking action with a game plan we're not being complacent in the relationship um we have a healthy identity individually and together as a partnership. Yeah. And so the, the healthy identity is a part of the greatness mindset. So everything I've written about, we're doing I know. in the relationship. <laughs> now, yeah. it also doesn't mean like there, that everything is always going to be perfect and there's never a challenge or adversities in life. It just means we have a foundation of a way of thinking, acting, behaving that supports us moving forward. Mm -hmm. In the book, I talk about this mindset in motion process. And I think this is really interesting, especially in relationships, because a lot of people struggle with this. Page 173, I talk about this. And I think relationships specifically get caught in a negative loop 
Mm -hmm. um, and people get stuck in the past too much in relationships, and they get resentful. Oh, so much. And or, they, they, they hurt each other. Mm -hmm. and, our, and our thoughts like, are... Like yeah. the competitive mindset that yeah. we were talking about before. You know, success versus greatness mindset. In a relationship, too, if you make it about you versus me, I want to be right, so then therefore you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You won't expand, have a joyful, peaceful, beautiful relationship because you're competing with exactly. each other. But as, in if, as opposed to if you have a clear vision of what yeah. the, you guys are creating and what we are creating, then we remember the vision and it's almost like the vision is guiding us. Exactly. Yeah. So here's something that might happen. Here's an example. We both went to Dr. Joe Dispenza's workshop. Yes. So I wrote about this, what he said in the book when I interviewed him. He said, some people wake up in the morning and the first thing they do is they think about the problems. Those problems are memories that are etched in the brain that are connected to certain people, certain objects, certain things at certain time and place. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. Mm -hmm. So then all of a sudden, they start feeling unhappy. Now the body is the past because the thoughts are the language of the brain and the feelings are the language of the body. And I think when we catch that, the thoughts are the feelings of the brain and the mm. feelings are the language of the body. Yeah, I love that. A lot of people in relationships get taught get tied to their past thoughts of this person did this thing, they hurt me here, they said this thing, I'm gonna hold on to that. And then I'm gonna have an unhappy feeling that is connected to my body, connected to my thoughts. Then I'm gonna have a mm -hmm. behavior that reflects my the way I think yeah. and feel about the person I'm in a relationship with. Yeah. Because I wake up and I'm still holding on to this past thought and my body still feels the emotion, I'm gonna act in a way that is not good to my partner yeah. in the relationship. I'm gonna behave in a way that doesn't support the meaningful mission that we have. Mm -hmm. Because I lack a meaningful mission probably. It's like a wheel. So I thought So the thought which, which creates an emotion. Which is yeah. What I have here. There you have it. Which I love it. Here. Yeah. The thoughts so create thoughts, an emotion. Thoughts impact emotions and emotions impact behaviors and they all impact one another. Yeah. And the mindset in motion is really unpacking each one of these things so that they can evolve to be more harmonic in our body, in our mind, and in our actions. And when we are in more harmony, and again, this, this, this really goes back into you reshaping your identity with yeah. yourself first. Mm -hmm. Because if we're, we're saying nasty things to us, then that's gonna reflect in others as well. And we're gonna be judging and comparing others as well based on how we think about ourselves. So it's all working together, and that's why we talk about this mindset in motion. It's a process. You've gotta untangle one element and the next element and start building a new motion of positive energy that is in harmony. And you start creating a new personality. And by the way, also you can start creating a new personality of the relationship. You know, if you're if 100%. you if you're if you're a guy and you come home and you're like, ah, oh, I don't want to come home because my wife always has all these complaints, that is a thought that creates an emotion of you don't want to be there, ah, frustration, whatever, yes. that then creates a behavior of like, again, frustration, bitterness, whatever it is, avoidance, and then that becomes this this cycle, as if you start paying attention to your wife and you say, you know what? She has all these beautiful qualities, mm -hmm. all these things that she does. That creates a good emotion. That creates a good feeling of being grateful for being with each other. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the greatest skills is emotional agility that I think all human beings can develop. Yeah. It's just extremely hard for us to get there. Dr. Susan David, the author of Emotional Agility, explains it this way. It's the ability to be healthy human beings. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is every day we have tens of thousands of thoughts and emotions, right? So if it's constantly negative and looping, it's gonna affect you. The emotions might be emotions about loneliness, anxiety, and those turn into stories that we tell ourselves about who we are in the world. And we have these every single day. Yeah. When we experience stress and ambiguity and complexity, often these thoughts, emotions, and stories become more pervasive and they have a greater level of a hold on us, essentially meaning they have power over us. Yeah. So physical agility is extremely important when we are in stressful environments, when something is, there's a car crash and we've got to run out of the way or when someone's coming after us and we can move away, 
physical agility, people understand, but emotional agility. We've got tens of thousands of car crashes happening in our brain and our body yeah. emotionally daily. We need to be able to like swerve around and have the emotional agility to move beyond them and not let them affect us. Mm -hmm. And but no think, wonder why people are stressed all the time, because, and, you know, most of us, because we have those thoughts. Exactly. Some of, a lot of them are not even real. Yes. But the body doesn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So then, therefore, it creates all this stress. I yes. want to ask you two last things. Mm -hmm. One of them is you, when you and I met, uh, we talked you a lot. You fell in love with me the moment I you did. saw me. <laughs> no. I I liked you. I needed to get to know you better That's to conscious fall in relationship. love. Yes, um, and I love you very much. Te amo. Te amo. Cuando when you and I met, mm -hmm. we were talking a lot about acceptance. Right to be accepted, being an accepting, accepting of each other, which mm -hmm. we are. And in our conversations, but sometimes I wish we would record them because we would have, you know, a podcast of all these conversations. We talk about this a lot, but you cannot accept another person unless you have acceptance of yourself. And in order to do that, and you said this today. It's almost like you have to be able to also take a look at your shadow, mm -hmm. recognize it and own it and work through it yeah. and work in all those parts of you. Is there a part of yourself today, not five years ago, not before writing the book today, that you think, hmm, I get to work on this? There's still a part of me <laughs> that, that is competitive. Okay. And I don't think this is bad. I just think it's, I get to constantly look at it and say, okay, is this coming from a place of competition in a healthy way or competition because I still feel like I'm not enough in certain ways okay. or still feel like I'm judging or comparing myself to certain things or people. And again, it's not like a bad or wrong thing. I just don't know if it's the most useful thing for me to be competitive and the need to be right. Okay. Some ways it works in my favor and other times it just leaves me feeling stressed out or overwhelmed. Mm. And it's not like it happens all the time. If you would have met me 10 years ago, it would have been like all the time. But I think that is one thing that just came to my mind um, that I feel like I noticed from just the last few days of me kind of getting like this, you know, oh, this competitive energy. I'm like, okay, that doesn't really serve me or, or anything, you know, when I'm in that way. But it's like this kind of need to be right sometimes or need yeah. to justify something. So that would be the thing that I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's unhealthy. It's just something I noticed recently. Well, what I think it's healthy is what you're doing, you know, and you said it in the book and you do it every day and I do it, is to be able to look at those parts of us. Because if we don't have acceptance or mm -hmm. compassion yeah. towards ourselves and knowing you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, mm -hmm. we're always a work in progress then if you don't have the compassion towards yourself, how are you going to have it for the other person yeah, exactly. that you're sharing your life with? So I can't beat myself up about it all the no. time because that's not a healthy identity. No. But it's just reflecting on it and saying, okay, it's not helpful, it's not useful when I go that far. You know, maybe go right. up to this line and then stop and pull back. Mm. But when I uh, push it a little farther, and just, uh, that's not helpful for mm -hmm. me, my emotions, my thoughts, and the abundance I want to create in that moment. I'm living in a past pain or a frustration that's just not serving me. And so I think I'm, I think I reflect on it really well after the fact. And I think if I ever cross a line or something, you'll like kind of give me a little nudge and say, Hey, do we need to like, you know, I see you, but do you need to go that far? So you do a good job of reminding me, but also accepting me in, in yeah. my state, not trying to change me, not trying to, humans, yeah. right? And no, I don't like, why would I want to change you? You have yeah. your own process at mm -hmm. your own timing of anything. And for me too, mm -hmm. by the way, you're not trying to change me. You yeah. remind me of my own vision. And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That's what I, I love about the way we are with each other. Because we remind each other of our own vision. Yes. I'm not trying to make you have my become a vision. I wouldn't even be with you if that right. was the case, you know, like to make you someone else. I like you. 
how you are and in the journey that you are. Um, and so the last question is this. Mm. You are just about to start a new season in your life, a new decade. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's very exciting for me to be a part <laughs> of this season yes. with you. Um, what do you think, if you could pull wisdom from the 50-year-old you mm -hmm. to tell you to the person you are today, mm -hmm. What do you think would be a good advice that that person will give you? Hmm. I feel like there's going to be certain things I'm going to need to do over the next decade. Yeah. Then when I do them, I won't need to do them anymore. Okay. Like? So my 50 year old self is going to be like, you know what? Make sure to, to really take time to relax and reflect and enjoy the moments, mm -hmm. like, which I feel like I actually do really well You right do, now. you're very good, yeah. So, but I, and I feel like I'm gonna be in a season of creating at a different level, creating abundance at a different level in my life. And I think my 50 year old self would just tell me, hey, just make sure you keep enjoying every moment, like enjoying mm -hmm. the process. Every day is a celebration. Don't wait until five years of accomplishing a goal or some milestone. Like celebrate every moment, every day, with gratitude and appreciation, which is what I feel like I'm already doing. I think he'll, he'll probably say like, do more of that, and probably like not take everything serious too seriously. You know, like mm. don't get so stressed out if something doesn't go perfect the way you want it. Okay which in a way helps me stay focused when I do that. It helps me like stay attention to the details, but I've just got to learn how to make sure I don't go too far obsessive about something of the mm. details and allow myself to relax. Mm -hmm. Like it's all going to work out in the end. So it'll probably be that, but I feel like, uh, he'd probably just say, keep your heart open, but I feel like I'm doing these things already. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything I would change. I think he'll just look back and, and just be like, you know, you're doing the right decisions, but don't, don't let fear hold you back from acting courageously, being like vulnerable, loving, and diving into every next stage that you have. Like, don't let fear hold you hold you back. Right. The more power, the more success, the more opportunities you have. Don't shy away from these things. Lean into them. That's what he'd say. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I humble. love you. I want to acknowledge you. you for your book. Thank you. And especially for being the work mm -hmm. you're just not you know writing a book you're being you see it every this. day i see it every day you see it. and it's beautiful Thank and it's you. a joy and every every day we wake up in the morning and we say hi we're so you know we're so excited there's mm -hmm. a new day and no matter what circumstances because we've gone through many you know we've gone through being sick together we've gone through you yeah. know the passing Loss. of your dad yeah. and through all of this, I just continue to experience with you this, you know, mm. greatness mindset in, in, in you that lives in mm. you, but more, and even more than that, your heart. Mm. You have a beautiful, beautiful Thanks, heart. Thanks, yeah, I'm I feel a little like, <laughs> you know, oh my God. I, mean, I was just about to share something super intimate. I completely forgot the cameras were here <laughs> for a second. I was like, oh, I just want to. I love you so yeah, much. Yeah, I love you so Thank much. Thank you so much for making me more. For all your experiences in the past, because mm. they make you the person you are today. Yes. And you are amazing. Thank you, Miamar. I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for having me on yes. your show. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully, people understand it. Uh, and, and they will understand it. So we'll we'll, we'll do dub it this. in Spanish. We'll dub it in Spanish. Here's the book, and we have a lot of audience here in the U.S. as well. Yes. So, and everywhere we have people in Europe. So get the book. It's incredible of course i read it mm -hmm. and it's amazing it's if you really want to be in a good place in life to start a new relationship or refresh the one you have or or if you want to launch a business or if you want to you know get that promotion mm -hmm. or if you want to just like if you literally follow all the exercises in the book you're going to get to that place mm -hmm. which is why i wish i read it and you wrote it. I, I, wish I, had, I wish I had this book a long time ago but for myself. But it's incredible. 
Yeah, and I'm solving the problem that I wish that I yes, had once had. Yes. So. Me, and you, me, and a lot of people. So. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Te amo muchísimo. Te amo muchísimo. Now you have to you have to end it in Spanish. Sí, for your bueno ya voy a terminar, pero muchas gracias infinito. Si te gustó la entrevista, dale like, suscríbete si eres nuevo y puedes encontrar mi amor. Where can they find you? Social media, uh, please Lewis share Howes that. everywhere on social media. Mm -hmm. And School check out his podcast. YouTube channels. He has two, one yeah. in Spanish, one in English. Uno en español y uno en inglés. Sí, check them out. Yeah. Chequenlo, por favor. Está That's muy... Yeah. Eso es todo. Muchas gracias. Nos vemos en el siguiente episodio. Te amo muchísimo. Te amo. <laughs>